Majora's Mask, Chapter 27, Wasteland. Link stirred beneath his blanket. His bed was colder and harder than normal, and he wasn't sure what time it was. Did Tattle let me sleep in? He wondered. He'd vowed to never waste another day sleeping so long. Tattle knew that. Something's not right. When he opened his eyes, he wasn't in the knife chamber. He lay against the wall of a small room, underneath a blanket that provided minimal warmth. The small shack was unfamiliar, and he found a stranger sitting in the opposite corner. Link gasped, scrambling to his feet and letting his blanket fall from his shoulders. He still wore his coat, pants, and hat, though his bag, sword, and shield were gone. The large being turned to look at him as he stood. The stranger's back was made of hard, rough rock, while his face and stomach were round and soft. He's a Goron, Link thought, allowing his alarm to subside. The stranger didn't wear any clothes, but that was normal for his kind. Their natural bodies of stone provided enough warmth to protect them from the elements. His dark eyes looked at Link sadly. They were alone. A couple of bags were pushed against the walls, and there was a chair and bench, too. The doorway was covered by a thick hide. Light surrounded it, revealing that it led outside. Beyond, the blizzard still clearly raged. The makeshift door swayed to reveal a thick downpour of snow. The stone floor near it was dotted white. Link's eyes traveled from the doorway to the Goron to eventually find his possessions on the bench. He looked back at the large mountain dweller to see him still staring. His eyes seemed glazed over, as if he didn't care what Link might say or do. Did you save me? Link asked. As his memory returned, he realized that he felt significantly better. The remaining aches were only faint reminders of the faulty bomb. He still hadn't shaken the winter cold, however. The winter pulsed like a deep bruise in his chest. This Goron must have helped out with my other injuries. The Goron nodded slowly. Where are we? Link asked. Goron Village. The Goron answered. His voice was deep, though it was filled with his eyes' melancholy. It's doomed to be smothered in snow and ice forever. It will become a land where no living thing can survive. The storm coming from Snowhead has made it just as dangerous as the valley I found you in. Tattle's right, Link thought. Another memory flashed across his mind. Tattle struggling against the magical grip of their re-dead face assailant. His stomach twisted itself into a knot. The storm's coming from Snowhead? Link asked. Do you mean the temple? The Goron nodded. It's over. Darmani, our Goron warrior, died trying to stop it. Now we're all waiting for the cold to take our lives. It's just like the curse in Woodfall, then, Link thought. The swamp had been poisonous, and its cause had been the monster hiding within its temple. Did you, um... Link stopped, swallowing nervously. Did you see a creature in a cloak... When you found me in the valley? The Goron raised an eyebrow in misunderstanding. I... A friend of mine was taken by it. After it took her, it knocked me out and left me to die. What did it look like? The Goron asked. I don't know. It had the face of a redead, but I don't think that's what it was. The living rock didn't seem to know how to take that and said nothing. How far away from here was I when you found me? I need to go after it. You'll die, the Goron said. Even if you waited for morning to come, no one that goes out there expects to come back. But weren't you out there? The Goron lowered his head in despair, and Link thought he saw a tear glisten on his cheek. The gods had a different plan for me, it seems, the Goron said finally. Link stood there awkwardly for a moment longer, realizing he'd find no answers or comfort in this shack. I don't think there's anything left for me to say. Link walked over to the bench and grabbed his possessions. He tightened his scabbard on his back and secured his shield, too. When he put his bag over his shoulder, the Goron addressed him again. You can have the rest of the potion I fed you. 
He pointed to a half-empty bottle filled with a thick red liquid resting on the table. Are you sure? Link asked. I have plenty more. You'll need to finish it if you plan on going back out there. Maybe the gods have a different plan for you, too. After a moment's thought, Link nodded, putting what remained in his bag and turning to the door. Thank you, Link said. I would have died if it wasn't for you. You saved me, too, the Goron said. Link wasn't sure how to respond, so he didn't. Instead, he lifted the heavy doorway and stepped into the storm. The first thing he saw was a massive chasm. The shack's snowy front yard went only a few steps before it ended abruptly. The cliffside sharply fell hundreds of feet, and its bottom was obscured by fog. In the distance, a singular white column rose from the middle of the abyss. It was in the shape of an inverted cone, and the lower end narrowed away into nothingness. The lone, tall structure of ice, at its rounded top, had a cave opening. A sign was beside him at the edge of the cliff, but snow and ice had glazed the words over. Link backed away from the cliff and turned to see the rest of the village. All of it was built into the side of the mountain, facing outward in the direction of the lone cave protruding from the abyss. The sky was open to him there, but the village's opposite end was bordered by a massive mountain wall. Goron village was composed of several small shacks, one of which he'd exited. All of them surrounded much larger buildings in the center. The larger structures had great cone-shaped roofs, with large ramps and bridges circling them. Link had exited the building closest to the edge, and he couldn't see the village's entrance or exit from there. There was only the cliff. He turned back to look at the distant column. What could possibly be in that cave? He wondered. It was a giant sleep away, and he wasn't sure if something like that could form naturally. There was no wall behind it to suggest the possibility of a tunnel. Only a small room could be hidden in its darkness. However, Link's brow furrowed when he noticed something else. The snow collected in large circles in midair. Most of the snow kept descending into the abyss's fog. But a limited amount had randomly gathered to be leveled with the cliff. Is there something I can't see floating here? Link wondered. Link stared at the strange phenomenon. There had been surfaces cloaked by magic in Hyrule, but he had no way to expose those in Termina. He looked up into the dark, snow-filled sky. Night had come, and the mountain walls encasing the village did little to obstruct the continuous downpour. It's barely warmer than that valley, Link thought. As he stood there, Link realized he'd been waiting for Tattle's commentary on the odd cave or the levitating disks of snow, but there was only the whistling wind. I'll find you, Link whispered to himself. I'm not losing you again. Link turned and left behind the small hut, drawing his hood to block out the wind. He circled a few more small homes and found the mouth of a ramp. It ascended to circle a large building, though the storm and snowfall obscured much else. He carried on nonetheless, slipping only once on the icy ramp. As he circled the building, he realized there wasn't a doorway either up on the ramp or below on the ground. All he found were windows on the roof, which promised warmth with faint golden glows. The ramp eventually turned away from the building to reach a wooden bridge. A lone Goron stood on its opposite end, hands over his shoulders as he shook madly in the cold. Why is he out here by himself? Link looked down to see what he hadn't noticed from up high, a closed doorway on one of the larger buildings. The abnormally pale Goron kept violently shivering as Link approached. Why are you out here by yourself? Link asked, feeling guilty from within his coat. <laughs> Being the gatekeeper in this cold is hard, he replied softly. Do you want to enter the Goron Shrine? Is that what this building is? Link looked again at the doorway below them. The Goron gave an almost imperceptible nod. There's no reason for you to be out here like this, Link said. No one's going to break in, and you shouldn't freeze to death for no reason. <sighs> you, you came, the Goron said. Which means someone needed to be out here to open the g gate for you. Should I let you in or not? <sighs> yeah, I guess. Link said, feeling even guiltier. 
As long as there are Gorons I can talk to in there, then I'll open the door with a Goron pound. I'm going to close it right away so it doesn't get cold inside. So hurry up and get in. Are you ready? <sighs> Link nodded. The Goron quickly rolled into a ball, which seemed effortless and natural despite his large form. His arms and legs vanished as they tucked into his stomach. Soon, only his hard-edged back remained facing the outside. Link took several steps back as the Goron hoisted his entire weight off the ground in a leap. <coughs> his harder backside returned to the earth with immense force, shattering the ice along the pathway. The resulting boom resonated, instantly causing the stone door below them to slide open. The Goron then returned to his feet, leaving a black crater where he'd slammed downward. The gatekeeper nodded Link onward as he commenced his painful shivering. Link nodded in return, lowering himself onto the pathway's edge and dropping to the ground. The boy went inside as a doorway slid shut behind him, and an ear-grating, shrill scream immediately bombarded his ears. The high-pitched wail reverberated throughout the entire building. <coughs> The shrine was hardly any warmer. Its first floor was a large, empty plaza with a ramp leading up to a second story and another leading to a basement. A massive stone carving of a Goron's face was positioned against the wall at the plaza's far end, hovering over a second-story doorway. Unlit torches littered the room, and Link ignored an irrational compulsion to find a way to light them all. Gorons were everyone, though they all ate or sat in silence. Most of their hands covered their ears to shut out the noise, likely in vain. Hardly any of the Gorons spared Link a glance as he walked in. Is that a baby? Link thought. If so, they had really, really powerful lungs. Uh, what's going on? Link asked, approaching a group of three Gorons. They surrounded a small pile of food that seemed hardly fit for one. One Goron scrunched his face in obvious misunderstanding. What's going on? Link repeated, raising his voice this time. We're at our wit's end, the Goron said, half yelling himself. His sad eyes relayed immense pain. The crying had clearly gone from annoying to oppressive. The elder went to Snowhead and doesn't seem to be coming back. Now his son is so lonely that he won't stop crying. It keeps getting colder outside, and inside we're so cold we could freeze. Why is everyone crowded in here like this? Link asked. He noticed that each group of Gorons surrounded a meager pile of food and belongings. Uh, they're sheltering in here, Link realized. We'd already be dead if we stayed out there, the Goron said. Our huts don't shut out the cold as much as the shrine does. But there's still someone out there, Link said. The crying had already caused a headache to flower in the center of his forehead. He couldn't help but wince like everyone else around him. I know, the gatekeeper. We take turns keeping watch. No, not him, Link said. In a hut, out near the edge by the cliff. Near Lone Peak Shrine? Link recalled the cave rising from the abyss and the levitating disks of snow. Yes, he answered. He found me freezing to death in a valley near here and brought me to his hut. Orbis? The Goron said. His expression immediately fell even further. He went into the valley to die after that masked demon killed his son. We didn't think he was coming back. Link grimaced. I knew something felt off, he thought. You look like you're doing fine despite all this noise, another Goron chimed in. I can feel it in my gut. It's echoing in my empty stomach. The first Goron turned to the newcomer. I wish someone would do something. I can feel it pounding in the back of my head. Link didn't bother trying to scream another response over the crying baby. He deduced that the crying came from the second floor. He walked up the ramp, traveling around the shrine until he stood beneath the stone carving. A decorative rug led to another room topped by what appeared to be a crown. For the Elder, Link realized. The Elder's chambers were elaborate in comparison. The rug ended at a large, ornate chair centered in the room. A small Goron sat in it. 
The baby wore a crude diaper, and an unusually long, single curl of hair protruded from his head. His mouth was wide open, causing every Goron in the vicinity to suffer ten times over what the lack of food and cold already caused. The baby's eyes were squeezed shut as tears welled freely. The two helpless Gorons stood at either side, ears covered in pain. <laughs> baby screamed. One of the Gorons stepped forward to greet Link before he had to come any closer. This is the room of the Goron tribe's elder! Do you have business with him? Link wasn't sure how to respond, but he was spared of having to. Unfortunately, he's out! Since the elder is gone, his son won't stop crying! I wish someone would do something! <laughs> Daddy! <laughs> The Goron baby cried, whimpering when he heard the other Goron speak. <laughs> I'm cold, Daddy! <laughs> he then immediately went back to screaming. I actually came to help! Link said, raising his voice even louder than before. But I need to find my friend first! Something with a Redead's face kidnapped her? It was wearing a cloak and used magic to control our bodies just by... Looking at us! The Goron looked at Link with blatant disbelief. Redeads? I thought those were only legends! It wasn't a Redead! Link said. I don't really know what it was! The Goron's expression didn't change, which meant Link wasn't getting anywhere. Let's try something else, he thought. Do you know where I can find the masked imp? The Goron's expression instantly darkened. What business could you have with a demon like him? I'm trying to stop him, Link said. I think the Redead thing has something to do with him. We don't know his whereabouts, the Goron said bluntly. He's caused our tribe a great tragedy. Some believe he's responsible for the never-ending winter. I know, Link said, sighing. But I need to find him. Which way would I go if I was heading north? Towards the edge of Termina? The Goron's face grew even grimmer, taking his hands down briefly as if he'd forgotten the crying. Do you have a death wish? The mass demon? The edge of Termina? Do you realize what dark magic you're seeking? Yes, Link said, growing irritated. Just tell me which way to go. I don't have time left to waste. The Goron paused, eyeing him intently for signs of wickedness before he answered. There's a passageway behind the Goron Shrine on the opposite side of the doorway. That's where the edge of Termina is. Link nodded. Thank you! He turned to leave the room, though the Goron still looked after him strangely as he did. Link passed the chasm's odd column of ice again as he returned to Gorbis's hut. He took a deep breath and threw back the doorway's hide. Gorbis! The Goron had it moved, still sitting silently in his home's corner. He turned emotionlessly to face his visitor. I know about your son, Link said carefully. Gorbis's eyes widened, but only for a moment. He quickly went back to staring meekly at the wall. But you don't have to die too. Link said, continuing despite Gorbis's disinterest. You saved my life, and now I'm going to save yours. Give me two days, and if I haven't stopped the demon that cursed Snowhead, then I won't stop you from going back to the valley. I came here to bring Spring back to Snowhead, and I want you to be here to see it. There's still hope. Gorbis didn't say anything, but Link hadn't expected him to. I said what I needed to, the boy thought and then he left the hut without another word. The cold, snowy night was as fierce as ever. The wind whistled with death over the cliff's edge, but Link approached it regardless. Lone Peak Shrine, that Goron inside had called it. Morning was still far away, but he could still see flat circles of snow floating in midair. Each one was within jumping distance of the next, making their way to the distant cave. Link almost turned away, but something else fell from the sky and caught his attention. A feather. 
He looked up to see a great brown owl flying overhead, each grand flap of its wings graceful despite the storm. Link watched the feather lightly drift downward, as if defying the heavy wind. It eventually landed on the floating disk of snow dust, confirming Link's theory. There is something invisible there, he thought. As the fallen feather blew away, the owl kept flapping its wings to leave Snowhead behind. I must be crazy, Link said to himself. He stepped back from the edge, eyeing the layer of levitating ice intently. Don't be stupid, Link, he said, mimicking Tattle's voice. You'll get yourself killed, and then the Skull Kid will win in the lamest way possible. Is it really worth gambling away the fate of Termina just to satisfy your morbid curiosity? There, naturally, was no response. I miss her so much, he thought, and it's only been a few hours. <sighs> I'm doing this for you, he said to himself again. There have to be answers in there. So... Link ran, kicking off the cliff to jump. His hood blew off his head, and Link landed on the small disk of snow, on his stomach. His entire body seemed just large enough to fit. Looking down, he could see through the floating ice into the deep abyss. His stomach immediately churned with terror. He wasn't sure what was worse, jumping on invisible platforms in the mountains, or jumping on invisible platforms in the cramped, dark tunnels of Hyrule's Shadow Temple. Link breathed in deeply before trying to stand, and slipped almost immediately. He retreated to the safety of lying flat, staring downward into nothingness again. This is ridiculous, Link thought, wondering if fake Tattle had been right. It's hard to trust something invisible to keep me from falling. His second attempt at standing was more successful, though he shook on his feet. Link eventually summoned enough courage to leap to the next platform. Throughout the journey, the wind lashed violently, whispering a lethal promise. You will fall, and Snowhead will consume you. The snow only barreled down harder, stinging his face. He always landed on his stomach, and he'd immediately slip if he tried to land on his feet. He hugged the ice each time, which seemed to grow colder with every leap. Sometimes he spun around to see Goron Village after landing. No one knew he was there. The village became a distant landmark built into the cliffside. No one will ever know if I fall here. On the fifth platform, the wind blew his hat away. The green funnel slid from his head and drifted into the lone cave shrine. With nothing protecting his head, the cold stung even more bitterly. Link tried to pull his hood up, but it blew off each time. Then he stood a final time and leapt for the cave's mouth. Link's hands grabbed the snowy ledge and he pulled himself into the ice column's shelter. Inside, it was a large, mostly empty cavern, and the wind was finally muted. Three massive boulders sat undisturbed amidst crabgrass, which was yellowed and dead. A large treasure chest sat in the cave center, outlined in gold. Nothing and no one else was there. Who would put a chest all the way out here? Link retrieved his fallen hat and approached the container. He could easily fit inside of it, and he wondered if the item inside was just as large. He unfastened the latch and flung the lid open, but it was still too tall for him to see inside. Link shook his head and threw his body over the chest slip. A small purple magnifying glass sat inside, dwarfed by its container and shoved into a corner. He picked it up by the handle, sliding off the chest and turning the newfound object in his hand. The lens had a large purple eye in its center, and three decorative red triangles sticking from its upper rim. A single golden ring rested near the handle's bottom. Link's mind flashed to Kakariko Village's deep, dark dungeon. He was ten again, enclosed in a room of soft dirt. Rotting white hands stained with blood reached for his face. Five other monstrous limbs swayed like deadly tree limbs, and soon, long red nails dug into Link's face, holding him still. He could barely make out a mass of bloody flesh sloshing toward him like a gray slug. Its eyes were dark pits, licking its lips as it bared plentiful, sharp teeth. Link stumbled backwards, his hand going to his forehead after the memory left. <coughs> Whoa! The item in his hand was no magnifying glass. The lens of truth, Link said. The horrors of those monsters were still vivid, but he'd managed to defeat them all and come back out alive. With this in my possession. Somehow, it had also found its way to Termina. Or maybe there's more than one, Link wondered. 
He wondered if it worked the same. Link walked to Lone Peak Shrine's entrance, standing at its ledge and facing the bitter wind again. He looked at the levitating disks of snow before putting the lens of truth over his eye. It was exactly as he'd expected. The lens defied the magic of invisibility that shrouded the platforms. He could now see six chunks of solid ice floating over the deep chasm. The snow collecting on top had given them away, though this magical lens meant all of its sorcery could be defied. Looking at the platforms, the lens revealed something else standing near Goron Village's cliffside. It was a large gray figure standing near Gorbis's hut, though it seemed faint and illusionary. Link furrowed his brow, dropping the lens of truth into his bag and beginning the journey back. The lens made leaping much easier. When he'd returned safely to the village, Link pulled out the lens to try and find the gray shape again. However, it was gone. Link turned in a circle, but the lens revealed nothing except what his naked eye could already see. He disappointedly lowered the instrument. I'm sure this will come in handy later, he thought. And maybe I'll see that invisible person again too. Link lifted his hood as he decided to finally follow the Goron's directions. As he walked, Link retrieved his bottle of red potion and took another sip. A momentary burst of warmth returned to his body. Link hoped there was enough left to sustain his journey into the cold. He crossed the entire village to eventually find a break in the back mountain wall, forming a snake-like path upward. I'm coming, Tattle, Link said. It was a wasteland. The snow was deep, pelting down on the lifeless land mercilessly, as if unaware that it had already killed everything. The nighttime sky was hidden beneath thick, dark clouds. The wind carried nothing but death. The open landscape was blank and featureless, only sporting the occasional mountain wall to form a barrier. Only one person dared to venture across, and his thick coat, hood, and pants did little to protect him from the cold. <sighs> It's worse than the other valley, Link thought. Except this time, there was no Goron village ahead to offer solace. The only thing to look forward to was the twisted, evil cave. The one the Skull Kid always returns to. The one that led to the other side of Termina. His mind went back to Zelda, Anju, Navi, and Tattle with each step. He remembered his fairy dying on his Deku scrub chest, as the town walls had rained down on them. He'd played the Song of Time seconds too late. He recalled Navi, keeping some truth from him after he'd returned the Master Sword to its pedestal, leaving him forever. Anju had flown into the air, the explosion at her feet had left her a bloody ragdoll, limply returning to the ground. And then there was the Redead face. It had brought him to his knees and forced his only remaining friend to trap herself. And then it left me to die. Those deep black pits scarred his memory, though its hidden eyes seemed to hold some truth that would explain everything. Link stumbled to his knees, plunging into snow. He barely managed to stand again, summoning all the energy he had left to press onward. The intensity of his darkest memories grew with each step, and he knew that the wicked magic of Termina's borders must already be toying with his mind. Just please don't show me Zelda again, Link thought, not after his revelation about her in Clocktown. Then the snowy landscape stopped. Link stood still just in time, looking to see the ground ending at yet another cliff. He peered down to see a sheer unforgiving drop. Link followed its edge, hoping to find a way across. In retrospect, trekking through a blizzard in the dead of night had not been smart. Tattle would have told me to wait until morning, he knew. It was hard to see far ahead, and he'd almost walked over an edge. Going right, he found nothing. The cliff ended at a mountain wall and a small cave. To the left, Link found the way forward, though it looked more lethal than anything before. A narrow, icy ledge hugged a mountain wall and led further north. He'd have to sidle alongside pure ice right above a massive drop. Link sighed. I'm gonna die if I try to do that right now. It pained him to consider wasting any more time. Each minute could make the difference in saving Tattle. But Link resigned to go the other way, entering the small cave and going as far back as he could. It wasn't nearly as large as the one he'd found with Tattle, and there was no fire waiting to be lit. It was narrower and longer, thus providing better shelter from the cold. In its furthest depths, Link found what he thought was a Tektite's corpse, 
though he took a few steps closer to realize it was still alive. The creature was pale beyond belief, trembling on its back. It seemed on the verge of death and not the quick and painless kind. It whimpered as soon as it saw him, but it could not run. Oh, I wonder how long it's been stuck here. Unimaginable agony kept eating away at its life, but never took it. Link drew his newly acquired razor sword. Its blade was sharper, neater, and much more refined than his Kokiri weapon. The Tektite's red eye almost willed him to do it. His new sword's first kill was swift. The creature didn't even react to the blade. The Tektite simply ceased to live without any sign of resistance. Link pushed the body away from the cave's darkest depths, which he reserved for himself. He pulled up his hood and curled into a ball. His eyes went back to the Tektite's body over and over again, and guilt was slow to gnaw at him. What if it still wanted to live? Link wondered. What if I had given it my healing potion and made a friend? So much death had surrounded him lately, and he couldn't help but wonder where the Tektite was now. Did he give a chance to feel any peace? Or is there just nothing now? Forever, like Majora said. He didn't know. But... At the very least, it no longer had to bear the cold's agony. Link rested his head on the cave wall, sipping more of the red potion and eating cold bread. As his eyes became heavier, he wished his second adventure had taken him somewhere less hostile. I wish I was in the swamp again, he thought. At least there, he could avoid the poisonous water. And I had tattle. You mean a lot to me, Link. Tattle had said on their last rest together. I think you're all that's keeping me sane, too. Epona stopped as soon as she crossed the drawbridge. Link slid from her saddle and grabbed her rein, staring into Hyrule Field. You, you are, are already, already leaving, leaving this land of Hyrule, Hyrule aren't, aren't you? you? Link wished that he could have that conversation again, but the drawbridge was empty, and he and Epona were the only two in sight. I'm sorry. Link thought. I wish I could tell you that I don't want to leave. I wish I could go back to that day and actually listen. Maybe if I never left, I could have saved you. Maybe we'd still be together. Link took in a deep, shuddering breath. None of those wishes would come true. He remained there with his horse, standing by himself and staring into the spot where Zelda had once pleaded for him to stay. It wasn't until Epona neighed that he left his trance. He shook his head. Come on, Epona. There's nothing left for us here. When he walked away from the castle, he thought he saw someone behind them, a tall cloaked figure, keeping its head down to hide its face. However, when Link turned around, no one was there. He searched the area for a moment, but they were alone. He shrugged off the hallucination and headed toward Death Mountain once again. Link's eyes opened to find sunlight. A beam shone directly through the cave's twists and turns, as well as the Tektite's corpse. He sheepishly blinked his rest away, realizing over twenty-four hours of this cycle had now passed. Link jumped to his feet, renewed by the realization that it was warmer in the daylight. He went outside and found a partially cloudy sky and light snowfall. A young sun penetrated the gloom from the west, and even though it was less frigid, the wind was much less fierce. Link kept his hood drawn as he approached the icy edge leading north. As he worked his way carefully across, he refused to allow his mind to wander. He retained a single-minded determination to reach his destination. After thirty minutes of braving the steep chasm and the ice ledge's twists and turns, he finally reached solid ground again. Link sighed with relief, straightening his back and watching the land head in the same direction, north. The ground sloped upward several feet before stopping abruptly. That must be the top of the hill, he realized. Link's boots plunged deep into the snow as he ascended its peak. When he reached the top, Link's eyes widened. The other side of the hill naturally sloped downward. It led into a wide valley only a mile away. The other side was bordered by a high mountain peak which blocked everything behind it from view. This northern border stretched to encompass the entire valley and his entire line of sight. Link's stomach churned when he realized where he was. 
There was no other visible peaks behind this distant one. This was it. I'm at the edge of Termina, he realized. Link descended into the valley, slipping several times, but never descending into a complete roll. Eventually, small mountain walls bordered the pathway again as he reached the valley. They blocked the peak from view, but he knew this direction would eventually take him there. Then, he saw something at the upcoming corner, a lump, lying against the rock wall and covered in snow. Link stopped his brisk pace and approached it carefully. It was the size of a human, and when he turned it over onto its back, the snow fell away to reveal a frozen corpse. It was Zelda. Her eyes were open, locked in death to stare directly at him in terror. Her mouth was agape in an internal scream, revealing the ghost of her final moments of agony. Link gasped, letting go of the corpse as it rolled back into the snow. He shook as he backed into the pathway's opposite wall. His eyes couldn't tear away from her, and his lips quivered as they searched for words. It took him a moment to regain his senses, and he reached into his bag for the lens of truth. As soon as he looked into the purple eye on its glassy surface, her corpse was gone. <sighs> it was just an illusion, Link told himself, though even knowing that, he couldn't stop himself from shaking. He turned away from her body and lowered the lens, refusing to look that way again. Uh, don't let a trick like that affect you. It's not real. Thank you. His eyes widened in terror. The boy followed the path onward, never turning to look at Zelda again. From the corner of his eye, though, he saw her body moving. Link, I'm, I'm not, not dead, dead yet. yet. No, Link whispered. You can't hurt me. You're not real. I think that's because deep down, we all know. Zelda repeated Tattle's word from the last time they'd been together. The fairy had been crying in horror of the truths within the Skull Kid's cave. We all know there's just darkness here, and that's all we are too. Stop! Link said. Somehow, Zelda's voice was still loud in his ears, as if she was still right next to him. But Link, you promised you would come back. You're not Zelda! Though her voice was exactly as he remembered, and he'd been longing to hear it again for so long. Why are you leaving me, Link? Maybe he could go back. Maybe he wouldn't know the difference. Maybe he could be together with Zelda again, except this time here in Snowhead, forever. Come back. You're just a trick. Link, don't go. You're not Zelda. Who's there? Just stop talking. Who are you? Something slammed into Link's face. The boy stumbled backward and his hood flew back over his head. He rubbed his face, looking up to see a ball of purple light steadying itself with wings. Tail? The fairy seemed rather perturbed that Link had walked directly into his face. The hero trembled, as if not trusting this reality either. He gripped the lens of truth carefully in his hands, raising it to peer through at the fairy. Tail remained there, just tinted a slightly different shade of purple. The fairy furrowed his brow even more as Link watched him through the small eyepiece. What is that? Tail asked, but Link wasn't sure how to answer him as he lowered it. The fairy scanned the area as if looking for someone, and Link got to his feet and realized Zelda had vanished. Who are you talking to? Tail asked, nervously eyeing Link. I, uh... Link stammered. Tail's voice sounded nothing like Tattle's. In the place of confidence and wit, Tail merely sounded uneasy. I wasn't talking to anyone. But... The fairy said... I just heard you screaming. It was nothing, Link lied. It was probably just a trick. Don't people usually see things that aren't real out here? Tail skeptically took in the wide-eyed human in the pointy green hat and brown winter clothing. He glanced at the strange lens in his hand again, too. What are you doing up here anyways? Where's my sister? I don't know, Link said. I actually came up here to look for her. Someone kidnapped her, and I think it might have come from the Skull Kid's cave, down in the valley. Fear flashed briefly in Tail's eyes, though he swallowed it. 
She's not there, he said. Huh, you've already been through it. Well, no, Tail admitted. I went a little into it, but I just know she's not in there. How? I don't know, Tail exclaimed, flying past Link. The purple fairy eyed the path to Goron Village uncertainly. Well, I'm going to make sure, Link said. Then you're never coming out of there again, Tail said smugly. I'm definitely not going in there again. Where will you go then? Link asked. You were flying into Snowhead really early yesterday, so you must have been here a while. Were you hoping to find something here? Or expecting something to happen? He waited for a response, but the fairy didn't give one. Huh. The Skull Kid wasn't the same when you found him, was he? Tail turned around slowly, but he still seemed just as skeptical. Like brother, like sister, Link reasoned. They might not sound the same, but they were both just as weary of strangers. Tail sighed. Okay, you're right. Maybe I don't have anywhere else to go. But if we do find my sister, I'm not sticking around to help you with anything else. <laughs> of course not, Link said, turning to continue walking down the slope. The fairy hesitantly followed. Link was fine with the awkward silence between them. He stared determinedly ahead, alert for another illusion or trick. Tail, meanwhile, tried his best to avert his gaze, but he looked silly staring at the mountain walls flanking them. We're supposed to be enemies, Link remembered. I wouldn't trust me either. So, Tail said awkwardly, are you and my sister buddy-buddy now or something? What exactly have you two been up to? Uh, Link opened his mouth to answer that question. He wasn't sure whether to start with the time travel, the four giants, or the Skull Kid's descent into murderous lunacy.